Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our N4 OBE Summit. We are now on our third day, and this is a theme three on transformational education using technology, its challenges and benefits. So as not to delay this session, allow me to, to introduce to you our plenary speaker. Our speaker is currently the president of the American Society for Engineering Education and a faculty at Michigan Technological University, to which she also serves as an affiliated professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. She has received several honors and awards, such as Fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science, Michigan Tech's Frederick D. Williams Instructional Innovation Award, a recipient of the Ralph E. Pau Jr. Faculty Award of the Oak Ridge Associated Universities, among many others. She is also very much involved in research, having published over 70 book chapters, archival journal publications and proceeding articles, and even earned 23 best paper and presentation awards. According to her, her research and service interests would regularly intersect and involve undeserved individuals with an emphasis on research experiences to increase engagement and retention. Everyone, let us welcome Professor Adrienne Menorek. Professor? Thank you, Thea, for that very kind introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. A heartfelt thank you um, to all of the organizers for inviting me to provide perspectives at this innovative global conference. First, let me frame this discussion in the context of the American Society for Engineering Education and our strategic priorities as shown on this slide. My comments today will focus upon empowering engineering education to deliberately evolve engineering culture, which fits, which fits into innovation and excellence priorities. So let's pause for a moment and reflect upon the natural forces in our present world and their interactions with our engineered or built world. As this global temperature map from NOAA, the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association illustrates, energy transfer patterns are changing around the globe. Heat waves, droughts, wildfires, flooding, et cetera, are testing the limits of our built world and demonstrating how closely linked we are to perturbations in our natural world. Events classified as thousand year events are occurring annually with devastating effects locally, regionally, and we're seeing some of those patterns globally. Now I'm a chemical engineer and in process control, it's important to pay attention early to perturbations in a closed system because they can accumulate to catastrophic failures. Our planet's climate and weather patterns are demonstrating these increasingly frequent perturbations. Further, these events also lay bare the social justice of catastrophic events. Hardships resulting from climate change effects are not shared equally. Because socioeconomically disadvantaged communities have weaker infrastructure, they've been invested in less, they end up most impacted. While our past engineering practices may have addressed some immediate narrowly defined problems, they've also contributed to our present world crises, including, but not limited to, the one I've given thus far, climate change. But there's also a dimension of societal skepticism, resource utilization, I can go on. Now, these early perturbations can get overlooked when the larger system is not examined. So we've been trained to engineer four specifications. We engineer for society, we engineer for our built world, for technological and digital improvements, and for our planet. This ongoing and critically important challenge needs grassroots engagement and a pace of change greater than traditional engineering culture has allowed. It needs systems level thinking. So why systems thinking? Well, our world is interconnected and interrelated. The solutions that our built, natural, digital, and social world so desperately need from engineers require us to work across disciplinary and organizational boundaries 
simultaneously leveraging our depth of knowledge in our subfields of engineering, as well as the breadth, systems level thinking and framework. We each must start evolving our engineering culture to gain appreciation and respect for other fields and those fields ways of knowing or framing their expertise. Yes, it takes additional effort and work to understand, learn even the terminology in some of these adjacent fields, identify the optimal tools for the problem at hand, and then co-leverage those tools for the application or engineering need. So systems thinking, we have to keep in mind this really is grounded in context. So skills in our students um, and ourselves as practicing engineers are developed from guidance and practice. Yet we have built into our engineering culture regularly used vernacular that suggests individuals are born with aptitudes, they're born with gifts or other abilities. They're just good at math, they're good at et cetera. So when we frame engineers or budding engineers as having innate strengths or deficit skills only in a specific siloed skill set, we sell ourselves and we sell our students short. This is important because the engineering of the future really requires context. And that context, that knowledge, that awareness of the context requires that we ground that in our built natural technological and social environments of our worlds. It's in these contexts in which the engineered product or solution is utilized. If that solution or product doesn't fit the context, its value is significantly diminished. And we deal with the repercussions of the side effects of the poorly designed solution. Thus, context is the tool to drive more holistic thinking and to develop skills, not only in us, but also in our students that appreciate and bridge our built natural technological and social worlds. In essence, we need to exercise our skills in working across boundaries. But examining the entire system, embracing systems thinking is complex. And most engineers have not practiced the skills to efficiently tackle these difficult, sometimes termed wicked problems. In fact, as engineering educators, we have traditionally taught in a manner that is idealized and linear and design thinking, sort of yucky, squishy design thinking, only enters in in capstone classes. So we all really need to visit the underlying engineering culture, those attitudes and behavioral characteristics that either constrain or unleash our problem solving and quality rigor of the ultimate uh, result. So we need to address the approach and our, our result will be much stronger. So while we engineer for society, for our built world, for technological and digital improvements and for our planet, the underlying function, think of this as how we define key specifications. Well, that really has changed shape significantly and continues to change, but our approaches to solving these challenges. Really, they are perceived as Optima, but they have not changed in um, 75 or more years. And our mechanisms for learning from our mistakes, think along the lines of case studies here, that's, that's, that's what I'm referring to. They are way too slow, given the pace of change that we currently are experiencing in our world. And so our approaches, and our attitudes need to be revisited because the underlying function for which we're engineering will continue to change. We need to develop a process that enables those optimal approaches to on, in an ongoing fashion, be strategically and continuously evolved. So when I, I keep alluding to this concept of engineering culture, so why does this require changes in engineering culture? So currently, when encountering new, novel, paradigm-shifting ideas or approaches or bringing in some of these other contexts, our current engineering culture 
defaults to one of skepticism, scrutiny, and placing obstacles. It is not currently designed for flexibility, exploring opportunities, or cooperative rigor. In fact, in engineering culture, we're frequently dismissive of other fields. Our existing engineering culture also hinders the quality and the creativity of the next generation of engineers. We'd like to attract and encourage a broader spectrum of students to pursue engineering. And we want to retain those already in engineering. Now, my own experience, and this is consistent with the growing body of research, is that students pivoting away from an engineering degree are more often pivoting away from engineering culture than they are because they lack the ability or interest to solve the world's problems. And so as an example, as Dean, I examined GPAs, that is one indicator of this. And you will see that we have very highly talented students that are pivoting away from engineering. The point here is that our engineering culture, what we say, how we go about doing it, how we consider to include ideas or exclude ideas, determines whether the field of engineering can truly solve our current problems or just create even larger future problems. So a global effort is needed starting today to restructure those portions of our engineering culture that make us more vulnerable and less able to meet the challenges of today and the future. The specifications we recognize to engineer for and how we engineer have significant impacts on the broader infrastructure and health of our planet. Just as a starting example in engineering education, we can actually learn from our students. They come to us at a stage of burgeoning awareness of the systems, and they're trying to explore which of those areas they'd most like to contribute to in their career. But think about how we do this. We have a series of tests or routing mechanisms that guide them into a specific silo. And then our curricula teaches to that disciplinary silo. Now, we may have design capstone experiences that involve a small number of other types of engineers, but these rarely include sociologists, biologists, computer scientists, et cetera, all these other areas that examine other portions of our built social digital worlds. Engineering graduates then are started down this path of broadening their awareness, but they really have, they graduate trying to learn on their own to function across boundaries. Many of our companies that are hiring our students have additional professional development for them to understand the different dimensions of that particular business, but there's not a strategic effort to tackle systems level problems, which is why we are floundering with things big challenges, wicked problems like climate change on a global scale. So really, innovation is needed here in the middle of the experiences and the education that we provide our students in systems thinking. Now, within our educational and professional realms, um, it's valuable for each of you and each of your contacts um, to discuss approaches that increase awareness and appreciation for the complementarity of the knowledge and techniques of other fields. And it's going to take all of us collaborating together to slow climate change on a local to global scale. So as an example, consider exploring and integrating pre-mortem analyses. And, and there's a framework that's shown here. These are sometimes referred to as fault tree or more generally root cause analyses. And if we combine these into engineering and engineering technology education, then we train our students to think of what could go wrong, how things could be misinterpreted in each of those other contexts before we actually do a build. So this deliberate shift from relying so heavily on traditional post-mortem 
think of case study like examples that will help alter the mindset that a catastrophic failure has to occur before changing practices. Thus, as you're talking with your leaders, proposed pre-mortem and life cycle analyses be conducted to inform infrastructure investments. Push for the use of materials that can be regenerated, use recycled materials, calculate the carbon footprint, and push your students and your colleagues to ask if we are designing for the right reasons. Just because something can be done, doesn't mean it should be done. So we are all a collective group of talented engineers and educators. So in the discussions and networking that are available in this innovative conference, ask each other if there are other tools whose adoption will help us engineer for the rapidly evolving demands of our world. So I hope I've convinced each of you to learn as much as you can about different systems. It's intimidating, it's challenging, totally worth it. And to intentionally redesign our culture to embrace those contexts so we can achieve a better future. Starting systems to explore, just to how I framed it in this particular talk, are the built environments. The repercussions for our approaches really are global. And we are have reached capacity of resources in many areas. The pandemic and current wars are demonstrating the vulnerabilities in siloed handoffs of resources in our supply chains. Natural environments, nature and life is interrelated at complexity that we really do not fully understand at this time. We know pieces, we don't fully map all of this. Each human we add on this planet decreases resources for all other life forms on the planet. Further, our engineered human world is now influencing the climate patterns on a global scale. So the engineering that we do must be completed in context across disciplinary boundaries in appreciation of sustainable and just perspectives and constructs. In our digital environments, data and its pattern analysis are informing decisions. How this happens depends on the quality of the algorithms behind that. And many of those algorithms are facing history and they're using historical data. So they take history and they project it forward. As we all know, utilizing tools and technologies as if they're black boxes can have profound implications on quality, applicability, and versatility of outputs. So I'd like to encourage each of you to push to include this expertise, this computational thinking knowledge into your disciplines so it's leveraged and utilized in an informed and proper manner. So social environments, I've mentioned that a few times. The things we create can have profound and differential, things, the social justice examples I gave previously, impacts on communities. So our students, are actually a great resource for us to begin to learn more on, on uh, this and engaging, of course, with many of the sociologists and other disciplinary fields um, within our institutions of higher learning. So let's join together to make deliberate changes to engineering culture. Let's confront the detrimental portions of our culture. By this, I mean the exclusionary elitist practices and the multitude of micro and macro aggressions that deem ideas, people, and new approaches unworthy so that we can embrace systems level thinking. These new ideas should work in tandem with foundational principles. Our physics around us have not changed. We need to retain that knowledge of these foundational principles, just not the attitudes that are associated with them. And that's essential to solve 2022 problems that remain sustainable solutions in 2052 and beyond. So thank you. I wanna leave you with this quote, um, which I think explains uh, a ton. Culture, our engineering culture, is not a past cause to our current self. It's the current challenge to possible future selves. And culture is the key for us to be able to engineer for the future. Thank you so very much.
Right. Thank you so much, um, Professor Menorek. That was really interesting to hear from somebody who is uh, whose field is not in engineering. It's my first time to actually um, have heard about systems thinking, and I'm wondering um, how would it be when it's incorporated in other educational areas that are, you know, anti-progressive to restructure these uh, systems and culture. I very much like how you emphasize this, um, raising consciousness on resources Resources, and also on um, putting emphasis as well on reflective processes, because in that way, I do believe that it can guide students to create and um, design more sustainable projects in the long run that are just fitting to different environmental systems. Yes. Um, once again, uh, Professor Adrian, we thank you for gracing us with your presence for this in for OBE Summit. Um, I think we are not allowed to entertain questions for this plenary session, so this is where we conclude. Thank you so much, everyone, for those who are watching us via Vertex.